What's the last thing that we need to learn before we can start doing graphics? It's the ability to loop, to be able to do code over and over again. What exactly do we mean by looping? I've got a computer game where the computer is thinking of a random number between 1 and 100. By the time you finish this chapter, you should be able to write this same game right here. The computer says that it's thinking of a secret number. I'm going to go ahead and guess 50 to begin with, right in the middle. And it tells me that it's too low. So let's go with 75. Oh, that's too high. Let's maybe try 62. Too high again. So somewhere between 50 and 62. So let's do 50, maybe 6. That's too high. 53. Too low. It must be 54 or 55. Yay, so I guess number. Now, what I've got for a loop going on here, the code is repeating several times. This is only done once, but this code right here is the same code that's running here and here and so forth. What we end up doing is a loop while the user their guess right here is not equal to the sec secret number and we haven't run out of attempts because you only get seven attempts before this game will just give up on you and tell you what the secret number is and say that you lose. So as long as you haven't guessed the secret number and you haven't run out of attempts, then you're going to keep looping the same set of code over and over again. Okay, so what on earth does this have to do with good 3D graphical games? Well, 3D games work something like this in that the game that we're familiar with grabs input from the user, calculates where everything is, and it draws it on the screen. And it does this so many times per second. Up here I have a frames per second monitor, and this frames per second monitor is telling me how many times per second, in this case around 60 times per second, it's grabbing the user input, calculating where everything is, drawing it, and then it loops and does the whole thing over again. And we can even draw a flowchart that shows how this works. The flowchart would look something like this, where we start up here, and first off do we see, are we closing the program? No. If we don't close the program, we get the user inputs. This would be off the keyboard, off of game controllers, off of a mouse input. We calculate where the person is, the score, and if anything blows up, health. Then we draw everything and we loop back up here. We keep doing this until the user hits the close button or hits Q for quit, control Q, whatever your game uses, at which point we actually end the program. We can even loop inside of other loops. That prior flowchart where we showed that you drew everything, drawing everything itself has a loop. So to begin with, when we draw everything, we end up drawing the background, be it a black starry background or some grass, jungle, whatnot. After we've drawn the background, we start drawing a list of different game objects. Are all the game objects drawn? If they aren't, then we go down, we draw the next object, we come back up here. If we continue to have objects that we need to draw, we just continue this list. So if we've got a hundred different objects to draw, we might draw this a hundred times, and then when we're done, we finish and we move on to the next frame that needs to be drawn. So the computer loops a lot. It has loops inside of loops and it loops very fast. So how do we do these loops? Well, there are two different kinds of loops. The first one is the for loop. The for loop allows us to loop a certain set number of times. For instance, if we have a teacher that wants us to write, I will not chew gum in class five times, I can easily write that out in a program. So that when I run it, right now it says I will not chew gum in class. Now if I want the program to do it five times, I've got two options. With what we've learned right so far, I could copy this with a control C and then hit control V a few times to copy it. Now it'll print it five times and that works great. It prints it five times, but if I wanted to do it a hundred times or a thousand times, it, even with a copy paste, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. There's got to be a better way. And there is, and that's using a for loop. So what I'll do is, right ahead of this print statement, I'll do a for i in range 5 and then a colon. And then what I need to do for every line that I want to repeat, right before this P, I'm going to hit the tab key. And the tab key will tell the computer that 
this is part of the for loop and I want to repeat this five times. Okay, so when I run this, it'll print I will not chew gum in class five times. If I want to do it 15 times, that's easy enough. All I need to do is put a one in front of here, run it, and my code repeats quite a few more times without it really getting any longer. What's up with this range that we've got right here? This range function lets us loop a certain set number of times. And whatever number I put in between here, I've got my little blinking carrot here that stopped blinking, but at any rate, whatever I put in here is the number of times it's going to loop. Easy enough. What's this? This is a variable. It's a brand new variable. You could actually call this whatever you want. You can't change range into some other word. But whatever you've got over here, you can change that, and it'll be a variable that'll tell you what number of times you have looped. What you can do in a case like this is you can print i. If I run the program, it's going to print what the value of i is each time through. And it's rather interesting to note, and it can really easily confuse people sometimes, is what number does this start with? It's starting with the number zero. Anytime a computer counts, it typically starts counting at zero. And I told it to count 15 times, but it only goes up to 14. That's because the zero counts as one. I've got 15 numbers here, but they are 0 through 14 and not 1 through 15 like you'd expect. Keep in mind here, when you work with a for loop in this language and almost any other language, if you're going to loop, if you put a 15 here, in this i, you're going to get the numbers 0 through 14. You won't get a 15. You will get it to loop 15 times, but Again, not numbered 1 through 15, but numbered 0 through 14. What if you actually wanted it to loop from 1 to 15 and not 0 to 14? Well, you can tell the computer to do that, and you do so by the following. In this case, if you add some more numbers, you can tell it the starting number and the ending number for where you want to loop. So, it starts at 1. That's great. You might think that this number is what it'll go up to, but again, it'll go up to, but not including this number. This is going to be not inclusive for the end number, but it is going to be inclusive for the first number, so that just plain makes it confusing. But it's going to go from 1 up to 15, not 16. If I go ahead and run this, I get the numbers from 1 to 15. Now, there are other options that you can do. I could have, instead of doing the 1 comma 16, I could have simply printed i plus 1. In this case, the values of i will be 0 through 14, but right before I print it out, I'm going to add 1 to i, and that'll give me the numbers from 1 to 15. Another thing we can do is tell it to skip certain numbers, such as if I want to go from 2 up to 100, but I want to go by even numbers, I can add a third parameter to this. It works something like the following. This is the start. This is kind of the end, but it's not inclusive. It won't include 100. And this is the step amount. So it'll start at 2, it'll go by 2's up to but not including 100. And I'm going to go ahead, whoops, I still got my plus 1 here, I'll need to take that out. So now when I run it, I get the numbers from 2 all the way up to but not including 100, so I stop at 98. If I wanted 100, I could either put in here 102 or 101 would also work. And that'll get me the numbers up to 100. It is possible to do a loop starting at 100, go down to 0, and go by negative 1. 
This will start me at 100 and it'll do a countdown to zero, but not including zero. So my end number when I run this will be one. If I wanted to include zero as well, I need to make this negative one. This will start at 100. It'll go down to zero for a total of 101 different numbers. Now keep in mind indentation is important when you work with loops. In this case, because only the please is indented, the please will be the only thing that loops. So if I run this, it's going to go please, please, please five times. Can I go to the mall? If you want this to also be looped, it needs to be indented. That changes what the loop does. If it's indented, it goes inside of the for loop. Anything not indented that goes down here is not in the loop. So in this case, it'll say, please, can I go to the mall a whole bunch of times? And then it'll print aw down there. Now, indentation is really important. You can't suddenly re-indent This will not cause, but I really want to, to repeat five times. This will actually make the computer really confused because all of a sudden you've said, okay, you're done with this loop, and then you've indented like you've started a loop or you've started an if statement, but there's nothing ahead of that. So the computer's gonna get confused. It's gonna say unexpected indent right here. It says unexpected indent because in your code, You've indented, but you haven't told the computer why. There's no if statement and there's no for loop, so the computer has no idea why your loop indented here and it detects that there's some kind of problem.